Hello and uh, good afternoon to everybody. So on behalf of the uh, joint group, uh, British Burnt Associ Burn Association, Be First, uh, BAPRAS and Research Africa, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody today to this uh, Burn Care Symposium, uh, looking at um, uh, burn care in particular related to low middle income uh, countries. Uh, we hope that this is going to be the start of a conversation uh, which we have over the uh, coming uh, months and uh, year. I'm delighted today that we have some fantastic uh, chairs and speakers as well as panelists. Chairing today will be Stuart Watson, who's a consultant plastic surgeon with a specific interest in burn and microsurgery in Canisburn Plastic Surgery Unit in Glasgow. And the co-chair and speaker will be Jorge Leon Villapalos, a consultant plastic surgeon at Chelsea Westminster Hospital. Um, Jorge will uh, speak to us uh, at the start about uh, the changes in burn care and how these have influenced survival. Um, then uh, we'll actually be followed by myself uh, talking about um, the uh, immediate assessment of burn injury, and then followed by Mike Basler and Nicole Lee. Uh, we will have some questions throughout. Uh, we will have a case a presentation from Dr. Krishna Kumar from Ganga Hospital in India. And I'm delighted that we have uh, very illustrious uh, panelists from across the world, um, from the States. I'm delighted to welcome my friends, uh, Peter Javolsky, uh, William Hughes and uh, Michelle Hughes. I'm de delighted to welcome uh, colleagues from uh, uh, Chelmsford, uh, Sarah Smales, a consultant physiotherapist, Nicole Lee, the senior nurse within the Burn Care Network in the London Southeast. And I'd like to welcome uh, our colleagues from India, Raja uh, Shanmuga Krishnan uh, and Ram Vaharam from uh, Ganga Hospital in India, as well as their colleague, Dr. Kumar. And from Glasgow, of course, we have um, uh, Dr. Mike Basler, a consultant anaesthetist at the uh, Glasgow Royal Infirmary, and Stuart Watson, and finally, uh, Jorge Leon Villapolis. Um, we have uh, hopefully a lot of people who are interested uh, coming to us from Ghana. However, unfortunately, today, one of our uh, senior panelists, uh, Mr. Apoku Ampoma, is not able to join with us. Uh, we hope that this is going to be the first of many talks that we give, looking at the acute uh, management of burn injury. Uh, today, we will look at the immediate assessment of burn injury, uh, talking uh, at, uh, regarding first aid, distracting injuries, etc., and we will follow up in a month's time. Uh, we hope uh, that you can actively uh, engage today. We welcome your questions and we would be grateful if those questions could be um, asked via the Q&A at the bottom uh, rather than through the uh, chat feature. Um, that is going to allow us to uh, better um, have a flow of uh, the discussion. Um, our co-chairs are very experienced and will bring any points to the front. Um, we really look forward to uh, this event today and a thank you and I'd like to introduce uh, the chairperson of uh, one of the chairpersons, uh, Jorge Leon Villapolis. Uh, perhaps Mr. Watson will introduce him as well. Good afternoon everyone. Thanks Oren, thanks for that introduction and welcome to all our speakers and the superb panel that we have from all over the world. And welcome also to the audience. So our first speaker, Jorge Leon Villapalos, has established himself in the United Kingdom as an outstanding burn surgeon and educationalist in the burns world. And I'd like to welcome, to give, welcome Jorge to give the first talk today on the immediate management of burn injuries. Thanks, Jorge. Jorge, you need to unmute. Oh, 
Oh, hey, you're on mute. During the course oh. of the afternoon, we'll also have some polling questions to answer. And we're going to try and bring in the panelists as much as possible. I think I think Jorge is now ready to start. Yep. Speaking. I'm really sorry for this. Uh, no, I'll be quiet. Now. Small technical glitch. Thank you very much. Welcome, Jorge. Thank you very much to Be First. And thank you very much to uh, Oren Shelley and to my co-chair, um, Stuart Watson, uh, for uh, introducing me to uh, the audience. I'm here to talk to you briefly about some points that I feel we, uh, all of us should not forget about the median ass assessment of uh, burn injury. It's very important that we understand that we are all here because of uh, patients like this. And it's very important that we understand that despite our very best efforts, there is still a phenomenal amount of burns, not only in the UK, but worldwide that is still get injured to the, because of these specialized forms of trauma. This means a phenomenal amount of patients coming around into hospital and perishing because of burn injury. But there's also yes, no doubt that uh, our management of burn injuries is getting better because the lethal uh, TBSA 50, that is uh, that uh, TBSA for which half of any age group will perish has increased year after year. And this is all very clearly shown in these slides and uh, its progression. The LD50 by age has no doubt about it being improved for one reason or for many, and that is because of improved pre-hospital management. And with the reason why improved pre-hospital management is important is because it comprises a number of resuscitation protocols within uh, um, the, the management that uh, encloses uh, improved respiratory effort, the control of metabolic response, the control of infection, and a number of uh, uh, situations that are uh, more pertaining to the surgical management like early wound closure and enteral nutrition. And there's no doubt that these patients are surviving more and improving uh, their experience in hospital in terms of decreases, decreases in morbidity and mortality because we understand much better what the burn is about. And within the issues that make the, our management important, the pre-hospital care and the immediate assessment of the burn injury are not basically the less uh, fundamental. The reason why that is, is because in that pre-hospital management, the appropriate management of these injuries according to uh, protocols of trauma resuscitation understanding the, in, the need for, for improved respiratory support and an early management of the airway. And within that, and specifically within the transfer, the control of hypothermia, which ultimately is going to result in a control of blood loss are very important. There are other aspects of the management of an injury, such as the metabolic response control, the, uh, the support uh, at multisystemic level, and obviously as satellites of this, the control of infection, the early wound closure, and the early enteral nutrition that are also fundamental, okay? And why that is, it's very important that we understand that that immediate assessment of the burn injury within the pre-hospital care management, specifically the management of the airway, the initiation of resuscitation, and within this specialized form of trauma, the uh, assessment of the depth and the extent of the burn injury changes the outcome of the progression of the burn. And that is quite widely documented in a number of seminal patient papers. For I, I decided what type of sport that I enjoy could help me to somehow um, put uh, forward a very easy algorithm that helps us to manage burn injuries. And I came around with this very simple that I found very useful in uh, uh, the education of uh, uh, my trainees and when I give a lecture, which is called the Formula One car, a car algorithm. And this algorithm is, I feel, very simple because in very simple color-coded priorities um, tells uh, everyone about the measurements and the, uh, that we must not miss when we actually manage the injury uh, in its immediate assessment. 
And I would like now to uh, introduce each one of those priorities. So let's go about when the patient is going to arrive to us and we are preparing right before the patient starts, comes to hospital. This is first aid. And first aid is fundamental. Okay, the mantra of prompt first aid in terms of stopping the burning process and cooling the burn wound is still extremely important these days. But we must not forget that within that, keeping the patient warm prior to transfer to a definitive facility is of fundamental importance. And I am sure that there may be uh, some questions eliciting about this. I'd now like to bring in Rajesh Shanmuga Krishnan from the out, consultant burns and plastic surgeon from the outstanding Ganga Hospital in India. In Europe and the West, Raja, we take for granted that relatively good, for, good first aid is understood, is understood. What's your perspective on application of first aid amongst the population in India? Uh, thank you, Mr. Watson. Um, actually, I did uh, we did a study in uh, among the uh, the people in, the, in South India, and what we did found is that around fifty five percentage of them poured water, and uh, thirty five percentage they just rolled in the, the sand or used gunny bags to cover them up, and uh, and the other and the other people used uh, various other methods. And, uh, and in India, 55% we also found that they come directly to the hospital. And uh, I think that is better because the care in other smaller hospitals isn't that very great. Because what we found was that in the rest 45, only around 49% gave some IV fluids and 40% gave an analgesics. So in India, it is better that they bring the patient straight to the burn center. And we need to educate more people because only around 55 percentage were able to pour water on the patient. Thanks very much, Raja. That was a fantastic response. And, and I think that connects very well with the second priority in our uh, Formula One wheel car algorithm. Okay, so the patient basically uh, is in front of us. What are the priorities of management? Is it would be unsurprising to all of our audience that an accurate and systematic assessment according to recognized protocols of trauma resuscitation, and there are a number of them around the world, and to put some that are easily recognizable, I would say ATLS, Advanced Trauma Life Support, and the management and, the, and the emergency management of, the, of uh, uh, severe burns is one of them, help us to uh, um, deal with this specialized form of trauma. But why is this form of trauma special? because it has got two aspects that determine outcome, okay? So within the systematic assessment of the burn injury, the assessment of the burn depth and its accurateness will help us to decide the need or not for surgery and the extent of that. And the assessment of the burn size of total body, uh, total body surface area will help us to assess the just about most important uh, act into helping these patients in the 24 hours together with airway management, which is the need for fluids. And I'm sure that will be very interesting questions that we can ask our audience and that will be um, put uh, in the, uh, the Q&A um, part of, uh, of the chat. But uh, I would like to know if there's something that specifically would elicit the curiosity of our panelists, Stuart. I'd now like to bring in Ram Varam, consultant anesthetist, also from Ganga Hospital in India, where cooperation between the anesthetists and surgeons has helped to make this one of the most, the foremost reconstructive surgery centers in the world. Ram, what in, in the West and in Europe, we um, now have tremendous facilities for training in ATLS and in burns courses. What's your perspective on how that's going in India and how accessible training courses in emergency medicine and burns are for um, staff in India? Thank you, Mr. Watson, for the question. Um, uh, as far as A&D training courses are concerned, A&D as a specialty has only been developed in the last 10 years or so. And over the years, yes, the, uh, the training, the curriculum, everything has improved. That said, burns training as a, a subspeciality is yet to develop in our country. 
there is a lot of training for burns surgery, but there is not much of uh, focus on burns intensive care or burns anesthesia as, as a specialty. So we're hoping in the future, as more and more of us decide to take up burns anesthesia and burns intensive care, the courses should start coming up. Thanks for that, Ram. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, um, very systematic and thorough approach. So we have decided that we have provided first aid. We have decided that uh, we are treating these patients according to protocols of trauma resuscitation. Where do the patients need to be treated? and ultimately finished. This basically brings us to the need for continuous reassessment that will eventually lead to the safe transfer and handover of these patients to an ultimate facility. Within the aspects that are of ultimate importance to take into consideration prior to transfer are the control of hypothermia, hypovolemia, and acidosis, which are currently described as the triad of death. There is no doubt that appropriate communication with a tertiary facility major trauma center or burns unit is the ultimate destiny of these patients in order to appropriate progression. So what aspects of safe transfer and handover we can bring to the discussion? Stuart. So during my working lifetime, United States has been the example to us all really about development of the highest standards of burn care. And we're very fortunate to have with us Professor Bill Hughes, director of the Jefferson Burn Center in Philadelphia, and Michelle Hughes, the lead nurse of that burn center. I'd just like to ask Bill and Michelle if they could please give us some insights about what they regard as best practice for communication and transfer of patients from um, often in the United States, quite big distances to, to, to burn centers and what their view is about how you can optimize the safe transfer and handover. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Mr. Watson. Uh, there's a, a few important things, and of course, uh, physician to phys physician uh, uh, contact is one of the most important. Some of the things that we emphasize, in addition to the ABCs and the primary and secondary survey, is, is volume and, and fluids. Unfortunately, many patients end up getting too much volume, so we go with the uh, ABLS guidelines of 500 cc's an hour for adults until they can make it to us or until we can get the, the, the formula going. Um, and then of course in children, 250 cc's and 125 cc's. We also wanna make sure they stay warm, uh, transfer with uh, dry, warm dressings so they don't get too cold, which is very important. And we usually do the escherotomies at our center. Our center is also in uh, direct communication with the uh, EMS population and providers in our community. So we teach the advanced burn life support uh, about six times a year to paramedics, nurses, and physicians from outside uh, facilities just to educate them on the initial assessment and that first 24 hours of burn care. In the state of Pennsylvania where we are, we're fortunate enough to have quite a few burn centers. Most patients can make it to us uh, within a, a two to three hour period. That's not the same within the whole United States, which is why the advanced burn life support is uh, pushed so heavily within um, the burn centers to, to get out there to the communities to teach them the standard of care for the first 24 hours to ensure that this initial assessment is properly done and it helps with the outcome. Thank you both. One of the audience has just asked a very good question, which it, it, I'm not sure, I, we, we don't have this, but They've asked, do you have a minimum threshold of core temperature for transfer of a patient before they leave the transferring hospital? Which is a really good question and a good point. Do, do you guys have that? Because that isn't something we have. Ours is more informal. We do not. And we feel that we are probably better at keeping the patient warm than most of the transferring hospitals because we have you know, our fluid warmers, we have our rooms warmer, um, even if we go, we have an, uh, an OR in our emergency department, we can make very warm in case we need to do our escherotomies or some kind of uh, very quick uh, um, debridement. So we would rather them get to us and we feel that we could probably keep them warmer and get them where they need to be. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. So all of these uh, priorities uh, need to be actually put into some type of uh, uh, documents or protocols 
in a region we uh, have got, uh, we are very lucky of having a multidisciplinary uh, team that have put together, led by uh, our senior nurse, Nicole Lee, this document on the initial management of severe burns nurse, that uh, of severe burns uh, uh, assessment that I'm very happy to share with you. It obviously has got uh, in all of the priorities that we have discussed before in terms of airway, breathing, circulation, uh, disability and exposure. And uh, my colleague Oren Shelley will be putting some emphasis into each one of those. It is worth saying, nevertheless, uh, about the airway, the breathing that are tremendously important uh, in terms of actually is making sure that a number of maneuvers of ascending order of complexity are established according to the respiratory effort of the patient in order to establish a definitive airway. I'm sure that there will be some comments about the use of uh, scavengers like cyanokid that reduce uh, lactic acidosis specifically in terms of potential cyanide poisoning and I'm sure that Oren will be bringing that into uh, the, the, the discussion. The management of the circulation obviously is tremendously important and in these days in which uh, our experience with the military have brought a variation of this approach into A, B, C, D, for, uh, into C, A, B, C, D, E instead of the classical A, B, C, D, that is control of circulation uh, and uh, torrential hemorrhage first. All of these will be uh, dealt with with a number of uh, uh, um, uh, added uh, points of view during my colleague's Oren Shelley um, presentation. There is no doubt that all of these lead nothing more and nothing less to the safe transfer of the patient into the ultimate management. But what can we do? What else can we do in terms of ultimately manage these patients at assessment level? With that, I'd like Mr. Santela uh, to open the discussion, but introduce uh, my colleague Oren Shelley and pass the button for this to my colleague uh, Stuart Watson. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jorge, for a characteristically lucid and fascinating introduction. I'd just like to pick up a few points to bring in all our expert panelists. So firstly, I'd like to ask Peter Javelski, whom I regard as the outstanding bird surgeon of my generation from the UK, and who's now working in Galveston. And in Horgi's talk, Peter, it, it showed that we're looking for a urine output in electrical injuries, which is higher than in most other injuries. And I wondered if you could just briefly explain your perspective on why we're looking at that for electrical injuries. Uh, well, you're, you're asking me very difficult questions at this time of the morning over here, Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think with electrical injuries, there's often pretty high voltage ones. There are issues with, uh, you know, um, a lot of tissue damage, um, muscle damage, uh, myo necrosis, and uh, therefore uh, impacts on uh, the, the kidneys. So you need to maintain a, a good urine output. And that's usually by giving volume. Some people will consider alkalizing, uh, trying to alkalize the urine. But I think uh, high volume urine output is uh, sensible in the, certainly in the initial stages. So do you fi find that you give more fluid than you normally would for percentage burn and sometimes resuscitate patients with areas that you wouldn't normally resuscitate? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. I think that the, the, the key is obviously a fluid resuscitation is a dynamic thing, isn't it? You know, fluids are like a drug. It's a dose response. Uh, and this is what you're looking for. I think certainly in, uh, you know, multiple studies that the, the um, volume required to resuscitate patients with uh, high voltage electrical injuries is more uh, than the formulas would suggest. Um, but do would we uh, give uh, a lot of fluid to patients with smaller injuries, particularly low voltage injuries? I would say no. Thanks very much, Peter. I'd like to now move on and ask Nicole Lee a question. Nicole is the lead nurse from the Burn Centre at St Andrews Hospital in Chelmsford. And recently she gave some absolutely outstanding presentations on Burns courses that pre preceded this one. Nicole, I, I just wanted to get any further perspectives you have from a nursing point of view on avoiding 
problems in transfer of the burns patient. Um, obviously, we heard from Bill and Michelle about that. Any other perspectives you'd like to offer about that and things that you're looking for if you're in communication with the referring centre? Hi. Um, so I think um, our biggest thing um, and the thing that I'd highlight probably the most is keeping the patient warm. Um, we get patients that arrive extremely cold um, and we understand it can be a real difficulty um, but actually um, by keeping them warm um, it reduces mortality rates in the long term so it's really important and it's probably the hardest thing to do in the back of an ambulance um, so yeah wrapping them up as much as possible using your silver foil in between your sheets just helps keep some extra heat inside um, and um, if you can deliver warm fluids um, or something like that then that makes a huge difference but um, that's obviously a developing thing within transports. Thanks very much for such a succinct description of a very key point. Thank you. And I'd like to move on and ask Sarah Smales a question. Sarah's consultant physiotherapist from the same um, very eminent Burns unit in Chelmsford in the UK. Sarah, in terms of the initial management of the patient, obviously from a physiotherapist point of view, one of your key roles of your team is in helping with prevention of respiratory problems. Is there anything that people should be thinking about in the very early stages about positioning or other processes to prevent development of respiratory problems in the burns patient? Hi, yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Oh, lovely. Thank Thanks you. for that question. Um, I think in the early stages, um, the important thing here is um, that if, if there's a risk of a fire in an enclosed space, then we're talking about the possibility of smoke inhalation injury. Um, and this is something that is partially diagnosed by the, the, the nature of the fire, if it was an enclosed space. Um, that's something that, that we need to think about very early on. But I know that later on there are some talks about smoke inhalation. Uh, in terms of positioning, um, if the patient is self-ventilating, an upright position is good, but then you're going to need to consider all the blood pressure and things like that. So really, it's just about um, close monitoring at that point um, and, uh, and uh, assessment at the time. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to ask my colleague from Glasgow, Dr. Mike Basler, about pain management in the acute stage. Hi Stuart, can you hear me? Yes we can, thank you. I, before I uh, move into this Stuart, I, I, what I'd like to do is just get everyone to think about the slide that Jorge put up, which I think is a, a really good slide of all the different people that were involved in trying to change the wheel in that Formula One car. And when we deal with resuscitating an acute born patient, be as busy as that and one of the reasons I think that the American systems have led very well in, in the management of resuscitation of major injuries is apart from the fact that they get quite a lot is the fact that they are good at, at, at systemizing working out how they deal together with all of these issues and in my experience which is limited that's one of the areas that in low and middle income countries simple kind of defining of roles and working out and practicing role plays can make real differences for these things. Before I talk about the management in terms of analgesia, I just wanted to highlight that I think that's a really important point. We've got an unstable patient. We need to monitor this patient regularly and we're in a busy place. So what we should be doing is we shouldn't be doing giving big doses of morphine and not monitoring them quickly afterwards. You're going to have to give good strong painkillers, you're going to have to oxygenate the patient, but you're going to have to titrate it and constantly re-monitor this because you could be sitting on a patient with a, a mechanism of injury that means there's an undis undisclosed pelvic fracture or whatever. You may have a patient that may have a decreased conscious level. So from the point of view of analgesia, I would be using morphine. I'd be using it very judiciously and sparingly, but I wouldn't be afraid to use it as long as I was monitoring the patient correctly. So very similar to what Peter was saying about the fluids that you're rather yeah. than having this prescriptive thing in your mind you're actually adopting a flexible report approach and you're monitoring that and you're looking for the response from the patient yeah. well thanks to all the panelists um 
we managed to get you all in at some stage so far and we, we're going to, I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you further later. Um, we're now going to have the first of the polling questions, if we could please, for the audience. So if we just briefly pause. So the first question for the audience is, where are you from? And you can see for the audience the list there. So we'd be very grateful to the audience and we have a large audience at the stage if, if you can complete those questions. So we just need to wait a number of seconds a, a, until that. Um, we're, not doing, we're not doing too bad, Stuart. I think about uh, half of the people are uh, awake at this stage. I was slightly worried that Horgy was showing Ferraris in his um, Formula One things for some of the cars. <laughs> They're not doing so well at the moment, Orgy. Is that? Are you a Ferrari fan? I'm. I'm certainly a Ferrari fan, um, and and I am aware, based on Santa is that uh, uh, some of the people, based on Santa Lea, own different type of sports cars, like yourself, Stuart, that are not really own a collection of Lamborghinis. So thank you very much for that into the question. And please, could we have the the second polling question? Um, is that ready, or should we carry on with? I'll show, uh, I can show you this one first. Uh, here you go. Oh, sorry, that's the outcome. Uh, so where are we from? Well, that's great. We've got a real multinational audience and a very strong presence for Africa. So welcome to everyone who's joined us from Africa. And that, that's particularly dear to my heart because I, I travel to quite a few of the countries there and, and we have many colleagues who come from there to visit. And also we have a good number from India joining the, the, this meeting. So the next polling question is, what is your role? And you can all see the list below that. So while people are answering that, I'm just checking the questions. So there's someone asking in the questions for elaboration on fluid resuscitation, and we are going to do that. So in answer to that question, while people are answering this, we, we, will, follow, we will be following that up later on in the afternoon. I think, uh, I think we're almost there, Stuart, just waiting for a, a few more people who are not sure what role they're in. Give it another, uh, another five, ten seconds maybe, and then we can, uh, we'll pause this one. Okay, that should be on your screen. So as you can see, we've got mainly surgeons, quite a few other doctors, a number of nurses, therapists, theatre staff, and other healthcare workers reflecting the multidisciplinary nature of burn care. So a uh, great welcome to all the other staff as well as surgeons. And I, I hope that this is useful for you and that we're, we're making this an inclusive educational afternoon for everyone and, and not just for, for medics. So it's now my great pleasure to welcome my long-term colleague and friend, Oren Shelley, who is a burn surgeon who works between the lead burns unit in the country of Ireland and also one of the lead burns units in England at Chelmsford. And Oren is going to talk further on the immediate and early management of burns in, with more specific detail than Horgie's talk. So welcome, Oren. Oren, you're on mute. Oren, I think you're just on mute. Yeah, yes. there you go. And if you yeah. just go into slideshow, that'd be great. We're just not on slideshow yeah, yeah. just yet. Super. Yeah, it's right now. Almost. Uh... Almost there. Yep. So thank you very much, uh, Stuart. I mean, it's uh, a great pleasure to be here. And Stuart is somebody who I personally look up to as a uh, somebody who's a great educator, a fantastic surgeon, a mentor, and uh, somebody who's an impassioned colleague about uh, developing uh, burn care, particularly internationally with uh, a huge amount of work in West Africa to date and elsewhere. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the immediate assessment of the burn injury. And I suppose what's um, the challenge with this talk is there's, and I've spoken to a few people individually, even this morning about this, um, there's a huge variance in the facilities that are available within each country that we work in. 
And there is a huge variance between those facilities which are available between different countries and different continents. There is no doubt that the early intervention following a burn injury has a major impact on outcome. I hope that my talk will bring lots of questions. Um, for pre-hospital care, there are special considerations. They include first aid, they include uh, certain chemical injuries, electrical injuries and distracting injuries. Um, the immediate assessment must include the assessment and protection of the area, airway, and also stabilization at the scene and transfer of uh, patients. Also something that we need to consider is, is getting better information from those people who are first at the scene. It's surprising how often uh, the actual uh, story, a good history, uh, tells us a huge amount about um, how that patient's injury will evolve. And the story, it's great to see such representation from uh, Africa because, of course, one of the earliest documents we have relating to human endeavours to deal with burn injury and emergency dates from uh, about 3000 BC, 5000 years ago, uh, from Egypt in uh, northeast Africa. Um, and in essence, these have introduced the concept of a salve of resin and honey. But it's also interesting to see that contribution to uh, burn care has been given from around the world, from uh, Racy's, the Arabian physician, talking about using cold water, uh, the famous uh, European surgeon Pare putting on ointments and uh, washing wounds and so forth. Uh, Jupiter, who is very famous within reconstructive surgery uh, circles for uh, Jupiter's contracture, first noted when he was doing autopsy and burn patients that the fluid loss which he saw was very similar to that which he saw in cholera patients. And the last person I'm going to put in is one which is relevant to this series of discussions. We really want to have a multidisciplinary team approach today and I'm delighted to see that as panelists we have got um, fantastic colleagues uh, in nursing, uh, anesthesia and in therapy and other allied professionals and so it's really important to recognize the MDT and this is actually attributed to uh, Truman Blocker who following a fertilizer explosion at a port in Texas in 1947, uh, set up a way of uh, planning and managing burn care uh, that um, uh, we now use today. And it's just interesting to see how history goes in cycles. And we've just recently had a massive explosion of a fertilizer in Lebanon, uh, causing great loss of life. Of course, skin grafts are what we do to uh, close uh, the wound, and these we'll talk about at a later date, as indeed uh, this woman, Zora Jansakovic, who uh, in the 70s presented and published seminal work looking at the role of tangential excision in a very large cohort of patients and showing how with early intervention, she could get patients to return to, week, uh, turn, return to work within a week or so following injury. And of course, I'm also delighted to see my colleague, uh, uh, Peter Javolski, uh, professor at, uh, at UTMB Galveston. Um, and I know also my good colleague, Jorge, um, uh, spent a considerable time there. And undoubtedly from the States, we've had a huge amount of learning about the role of uh, early interventions, resuscitation, infection, hypermetabolism, and so forth. What determines survival? Well, uh, Jorge has shown quite clearly um, a diagram of uh, the improvements in uh, mortality uh, with age, but of course, those at a younger age have a better predicted outcome given any size of burn. The presence or an abs absence of inhalation injury is the next greatest determinant of survival following injury. But also factors that we should consider as being of uh, influence include the depth of the injury, uh, frailty of the patient, particularly with regard to older patients, and of course special injuries. And they include, uh, uh, of course, um, 
uh, high voltage electrical injuries, but also very specific smaller injuries from agents such as hydrofluoric acid can cause um, major sequestration of calcium and uh, indeed lead to cardiac arrhythmias and death. The resources, as I said, are hugely variable across the world. And so in this series of talks addressed to improving outcome in low middle income countries, it's really important for us to emphasize we need to understand what may be going on, factors in the patient's journey, and we also need to address and prioritize care. The principles of burn care, however, remain the same regardless of who we look after and whatever country they're in. The burn wound has got a lot of necrotic cells and denatured proteins which release inflammatory mediators and they have both a local and a systemic response. The skin is the largest organ in the body and the uh, skin uh, keratinocytes cover just, uh, not, are not just within the epidermis and the derma epidermal junction, but they extend down through the dermis uh, to, to line sweat glands and hair follicles. And with a burn injury, uh, there is loss of or breaching of that barrier, loss of tissue, and perhaps loss of blood supply. Uh, depth can vary hugely from one injury to another, and of course, the injury may uh, progress. So what, what do we need to do when we're at the scene? Thankfully, this is not a Ferrari. Um, well, as Jorge has quite clearly said, the first thing we need to do is to stop the burn injury process and remove the risk, as well as cooling the burn wound. We also must have certain situational awareness. It's important that people don't simply rush in as amateurs, um, because there is a risk of further injury to individual, the individual themselves or to others such as from a building collapse or if there's an associated high voltage injury. It's important to assess and to remove the risk from the patient who's injured. And then of course, it's important to initiate first aid. We manage the patients using the principles of advanced trauma and life support, advanced burn support, and the emergency management of severe burns. It's important to recognize that whatever parameters we use, one principle remains the same, that we must care for the patient who is central to all decisions that we make. With regard to burn injury, this may be isolated or complex. So an isolated burn injury quite typically would be one where a child has pulled hot water down as a scald, or indeed another domestic injury where clothes may catch fire, uh, such as when cooking. These will have a lower risk of a separate injury unrelated to the burn. However, in a scenario of complex injury, or indeed when the mechanism is unknown, there is definitely a higher risk of an associated injury, and that injury, while it might be obvious, equally might be hidden. With regard to an isolated burn injury, care is going to be specific to the case, cooling the patient, and of course, using a prolonged irrigation if it's chemical. We also talk about using multivalent uh, buffering solutions um, to address issues of uh, chemical injury where the exact agent is unknown, whether it's an alkali, an acid, organophosphate, etc. It's very important that there's awareness of potential eye injury with burns to the face regardless of the cause, be they chemical um, uh, or, um, or simple burn injury. Also very specific injuries, such as uh, uh, electrical injuries of low, low and high voltage, have got very specific potential injury. And we've all heard of uh, the discussion uh, with uh, Peter about uh, high voltage electrical injuries. The possibility for progression of that injury through uh, electroporation of the cell membranes and development of compartment syndromes. Other aspects of a 
complicated burn injury or where the mechanism is unknown. And while there may not be, while there may be an associated injury because somebody has had an unknown mechanism, patients may also have a hidden injury because they've had a prolonged immobilization. Um, this is particularly the case in older patients um, or those who are infirm or vulnerable, and this can result in significant muscle necrosis. Also, when the mechanism is unknown, we must also consider whether that patient has actually deliber deliberately self-harmed and they may in fact have ingested harmful agents. With regard to patients uh, who are unwell or the mechanism is unknown, this may be because they've had a stroke or myocardial infarction before or after the event and they're unable to give a history. So it's very important that we elucidate this uh, very carefully. And when the patient is in fact unable to uh, communicate, uh, we must um, check a, uh, with those patients who are intubated, um, patients who are potentially um, mental, significant mental health uh, illnesses, um, whether patients have got a history of a drug or alcohol abuse. And indeed, there are certain patients who are able to communicate, but who are unwilling to do so because they're vulnerable. And this especially is the case for children, but also with regard to adults. And we're all very aware of domestic abuse, which is uh, much greater at this time point, uh, as well as uh, uh, elder abuse. So this is an example of uh, uh, a burn injury to a hand. It's a very uh, small injury, but of course, first aid is given. You can see there's some epithelial skin loss and so forth. And we typically talk about using tepid water, uh, tap water at approximately 15 degrees, and it can be applied via flow, spray or sponging for up to 20 minutes. Do not use ice or iced water because it's very important to avoid hypothermia. It's really important that if there's been an injury to the eye, that this is assessed using fluorescent, um, as well as checking and documenting uh, visual acuity and giving prolonged irrigation if necessary. And this is a very typical example of someone who's had a chemical burn that we see from kneeling in cement. With regard to chemicals, these may be any of uh, acids, uh, alkalis, organic chemicals, solvents. It's important to give copious irrigation and it's equally important to recognize that the pH of the skin has a wide range, which can range normally between four and eight. Um, there is a very useful multivalent buffering solution, which is effective when the agent is unknown, uh, called dafotrine. I have no uh, relation with the, with the company, uh, but it is something which is very useful and now it's available in uh, many uh, settings in industrially. With regard to an electrical injury, this is a chap who came to see us with a high voltage electrical injury, having taken some wire from a substation, uh, which was set at approximately 50,000 volts. Um, and with a low voltage injury, so to go on a little bit, you can see that um, this gentleman had a very radical debridement and ended up with extensive muscle loss and ended up losing um, extensive muscle on the left foot, as well as losing toes on the right foot, and he had significant injuries elsewhere. Um, when we talk about electrical, we talk about low voltage and high voltage, and we arbitrarily set high voltage as anything which is over uh, a thousand volts. Uh, this is somewhat different from the industry um, uh, definition, which would not consider that voltage sufficiently high, but we know that at that level it can cause extensive injury and progressive uh, tissue damage. Uh, there's also the potential for a fatal cardio event, uh, both at the scene, scene and dysrhythmia following injury. Well, when you get the patient, what's it important to do? Well, when you first see them, it's important to note the size and the site of the burn injury, uh, the depth of the injury, and really important to at least assess and if possible weigh the patient because all of our formulae are based on the 
burn area, percentage, and the weight. And while we are reasonable at calculating the uh, uh, size of the burn injury, we are actually somewhat poorer at uh, judging the weight of the patient. So an accurate weight if possible. And there are a number of different ways that can be used to assess a burn injury. The rule of nine, London Browder, uh, the, ha the hand including the palm and fingers has been shown to be anatomically 0.8%, although it is somewhat greater in the London Browder. Uh, serial halving is something which has been used in a military setting, particularly in Afghanistan, whereby over the phone people will ask, is the upper part of the body preserved or is it simply the lower part of the injury? And of course, it may be easy as well or easier to use a subtraction technique. For those patients who have very major burn injury, it may be easier to um, remove those areas which uh, remain uninjured from uh, 100% to calculate the total body surface area that's been injured. And this is a very uh, typical form that we use, the London Browder, and uh, at the bottom you can see that dependent on the age of the patient, um, the, there is a completely different proportion of the head in a child, uh, an infant, compared to an adult, where a child is three times greater in uh, uh, following birth than in an adult. So our initial assessment involves doing all of these kind of things, and I'll talk about a little bit later. We have to talk about caring for the patient. We have to consider nutrition, uh, assessing the burn, checking pulses, catheterization, identifying associate injury, checking for tetanus toxoid and immune goblin, irrigation, getting an IV and airway, and, and going in a circle. And I think going in a circle is something that we've uh, just heard in Jorge's excellent talk um, uh, about the wheels going round, that whole concept of managing the wheel. Um, and it's important that we start with the survey and we continue. So we always talk about the primary survey, looking at airway management with cervical spine control, breathing with ventilation, circulation with hemorrhage control, disability and exposure. And now, in fact, we talk about managing circulation control as an uh, urgent and immediate event if there is significant blood loss. The airway must be cleared. We must protect the cervical spine if we are suspicious of another injury and we must intubate if appropriate and if that facility is available. And this is an example of someone in a collar. When doing a breathing assessment, you need to expose the chest, check to see if the ventilation is adequate and equal, check the saturations and check uh, blood gases. Um, we spoke a little bit about um, uh, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, and this is a very interesting uh, nomogram to work out whether the, uh, what exactly the concentration was at the scene. And so at the very bottom left, you can see whether oxygen was given or not, because oxygen significantly reduces the uh, half-life of uh, carbon monoxide. Uh, to give a, an indication of what the exact uh, original exposure of uh, uh, concentration was at, uh, within the body's circulating system. So um, if we uh, um, give oxygen, if it's available, Oren, we've lost your sound. Yeah, Oren, Oren, can you hear us? Yeah, if you need to pause for a second, we can't hear you. We've not heard the last few sentences. We're lip reading though. I think you're saying, okay, you're gonna check. You're not on mute though, so that's uh, that's one thing. Um, I don't know if you've lost a connection or uh, Stuart, I don't know if you or Stuart or Jorge, I don't know if you want to just check one or two of the questions in the box. Can you hear me now? Oh, hang on, yeah, Oren's okay. back. Yes. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll hold it in. If you want to stop for a question, I'll be delighted. No, no, it's okay. I think, well, I'll leave that to uh, Stuart and Jorge. Well, the, there was one of the audience has asked a very good question that I was going to ask Bill and Michelle first. Um, Bill and Michelle Hughes from Philadelphia, please. How do you approach monitoring and responding in a resuscitation which isn't going so well? Say in a patient with quite a bad injury where you're giving more and more fluid 
and their urine output isn't very good and you keep pushing more fluid and you're starting to worry that they're getting into respiratory problems because you're pushing so much fluid. What advice would you give about managing that situation? You know, it's, uh, it does seem to be common and, and we run into it also. Uh, depending on when it is, if it's more than 12 hours into the resuscitation, I will sometimes start my albumin a little bit on the early side instead of waiting for the 24 hours. Um, it does, uh, the, you know, the, the inhalation is, is always very problematic. And sometimes we will start to decrease the fluids a bit um, just so we can protect the lungs. But we, you know, keeping in mind, as most of us know, that if you do have an inhalation injury, you usually do require more fluid resuscitation to decrease the damage um, in, in the lungs themselves. But usually we will continue up, up, up. And then when we get to the 12 hour period, if the urine output is still low, I'll give my al albumin resuscitation earlier than normal. We also have our nurses very involved during these aggressive fluid resuscitations. We have policies that nursing uh, carries out. We're doing Q2 hour bladder pressures, monitoring that to uh, decrease risk for compartment syndrome. We're also uh, very involved with the respiratory therapist and monitoring their peak pressures as they're starting to get a fluid overload. Sometimes we'll, we'll see a ven the, the ventilator changes and we'll notice an increased peak pressure indicating to nursing that we are getting increased pressures in the abdomen and we're notifying the physicians right away as well. And that, that being said, it is very important to rule out the other reasons for not making urine or having more of a ventilatory problem. Do we miss the need for an escherotomy? As uh, Michelle pointed out, were they having an abdominal compartment syndrome? And if we help that out, then it'll also help with the urine output and decrease the pressure in the lungs also. Bill, that, that, those are just great answers and two great points you brought out. Can you just say a little bit more about the rationale for the albumin? And also just enlarge a little bit for the audience who may not be familiar with the issue with abdominal compartment syndrome and burns. Sure. Uh, we basically, I would... I follow the, the modified Parkland when we give albumin at 24 hours when the capillaries are less leaky. Uh, I don't think we're really sure when the capillaries get less leaky. So we usually like to wait to the 24 hours. I very rarely like to give more than, I mean, if it's previous to 12 hours, I usually do not, not like to give the albumin at that point due to the leaky capillaries. Um, and also with the abdominal compartment syndrome, we've We've seen it many times where sometimes too much resuscitation and the bowels start to become edematous and lead to abdominal compartment. And sometimes I see it uh, with kids and they get ascites and it puts a lot of pressure in the abdomen. So depending on the reason, um, we will, if the, they do have abdominal compartment syndrome by checking the bladder pressures, uh, if it's fluid and we can see fluid on ultrasound or CAT scan, sometimes I'll just drain it with a, with a peritoneal dialysis catheter. If it looks like it's more from bowel edema, I will do a decompression laparotomy with some kind of temporary closure, usually with a, um, a bag type closure. Thanks very much for enlarging on those key points. And back to Oren. Thank you, Oren. Thanks, Stuart. Um, and thanks to Bill. Um, yes, so um, when it comes to talk about breathing and then we talk about uh, ventilation support, uh, giving oxygen if it's available, uh, a CO, uh, an oxygen concentrator is fantastic and it's often available in low uh, middle income uh, resource settings uh, and it can achieve up to I think uh, eight liters per minute reasonably depending on the machine. Um, of course uh, oxygen cylinders are also available in uh, uh, many low middle income uh, settings but they have a finite uh, endpoint, but they may be useful if a patient has to be transferred or moved. A very simple things, it's important to nurse the patient uh, sat up at least 30 degrees so that you're going to minimize the, um, uh, uh, any splintage of the diaphragm. 
And I know in uh, Sierra Leone, I heard in one case of a patient who, uh, in the absence of uh, ventilate, of uh, being intubated, was simply bagged with a uh, bag and mask for a 24 hour period. So uh, there are different things that we can do even in uh, resource limited countries. Of course, one thing that we often do in the West is that for a higher risk situation, we will always uh, intubate and will also perform a, a bronchoscopy. And one thing which is uh, very much for discussion, perhaps in our Q&A or uh, afterwards, would be the role of uh, a cyanide antidote and when that would be administered. Um, going along with something that uh, Mike Basler said earlier, earlier, remember that opiates will have an unpredictable absorption unless they're given intravenously. And while undoubtedly they are inexpensive and effective and widely available, um, if they're given by a subcutaneous and or oral route, they may not be absorbed. And they may therefore uh, have an impact on a person's breathing, uh, which was, would not otherwise have been the case. With regard to circulation, we talked about hemorrhage control. We want to look at all of these things. These are the markers of the circulation, the pulse, uh, blood pressure, capillary refill within normal tissue, uh, oxygen saturations, and urinary output. With regard to disability, we want to check to see if that person's alert, whether they respond to voice, to pain, or whether they're unresponsive. This is going to be at the scene principally and to check to see if there's a pupillary response to light. It's important then to get an assessment of all of the patient, respecting that they may be cold uh, and uh, this may be done in a sequential manner rather than removing everything at once to remove all clothing, to remove watches and jewellery, but very important uh, to avoid hypothermia. And so what should we give? I put this somewhat differently to how we talk about in, in, in uh, ATLS and EMSB. We want to give, I think, warmth, comfort, nour nourishment, and we want to measure the effect. So with regard to warmth, well, this may be somebody who's had a, a burn injury and they're exposed and they're outdoors, they need to be kept warm. With regard to comfort, undoubtedly warmth is a part, but uh, I believe Nicole later on will talk a little bit about um, the dressings and closing the wound as a way to provide uh, comfort to the patient. And that can be done with very simple techniques. With regard to analgesia, no doubt Mike will expand on this somewhat later. It's really important to, to, to record what is given, when it's given, how it's given, and to measure and document the effect. And it's really important in all of this, as I said, that we document everything. Nourish. Well, we should give oxygen when we have it through whatever means we have, be it a concentrator, a cylinder, or a wall oxygen, or indeed intubated. We can give fluids. We usually give them intravenously, but it may well be entirely appropriate in certain settings for those fluids to be given orally, keeping in mind the various measures we have to assess circulation. Um, also to nourish, it's important to consider at the outset uh, feeding requirements, ability to absorb. I'll talk about this in a moment about the role of the first attender and getting a good history from them to know how what kind of feeding might be most appropriate. We want to measure the effect. Should be two Fs, I apologize. Um, and we do that looking at the urine output, uh, the blood pressure, the heart rate, uh, checking pulse oximetry, uh, ECG or EKG, um, respiratory rate, pain scores, etc. For a patient who's awake, we want to check uh, basics, allergies, medications, past medical history, last meal, and events. As something I mentioned earlier, the information about the burning process gives information about the burn wound. We need to know when the person comes in, how hot was the tea or the water? Was it hot water or was it hot oil that's used in cooking? Because that will very likely have a deeper skull burn injury. How long was the exposure? Did it happen in an enclosed space? Did their clothing catch fire? Was first aid given? We need to do a head to toe examination. And as I said, it starts with the first attenders. 
we need to know from them what was the GCS Glasgow Coma Scale at the scene. Uh, we want to know more about the potential mechanism. We want to know as well from somebody who attends somebody's house, is there evidence of dependency with bottles of vodka or alcohol all over the place? Is there any evidence that this is an assault versus an accident versus an intentional injury? Because of course, somebody might have ingested uh, something else. Is there any evidence of self-neglect or social isolation? These are very important when it we think about uh, commencing feeding and the possibilities of refeeding syndrome, which we will address uh, during a later seminar. Um, very important that we maintain a good documentation, that we keep records, that we use informed consent. Very important that to recognize this in India alone, I believe there are 2,000 different languages. I'm sure there's uh, probably as many more in, uh, in the uh, continent of Africa. Uh, and within each country in Africa, there may be dozens of languages. It's important that that person should have the, the, the history taken and the care explained in a language that they understand. And so translator is important. When it comes to using photographs, it's really important that we are respectful in taking photographs. The principles are the same worldwide. And one method I use, particularly in developing world, is actually to use the patient's own phone because that's with them, that's protected by themselves with their own code, and they can share it. Particularly useful for managing the progress of a wound uh, which is ulcerated or become infected or which has perhaps been grafted, etc. After the treatment has started, we really just keep going in a circle, doing the same thing, keeping them warm, comfortable, checking their alert, checking their saturations, checking their hemodynamically stable, checking uh, and rechecking their refill uh, and their urinary output, um, and performing an assessment whether there's an evolving injury. Now, this is more the case where there is a complicated or complex injury or where the mechanism is unknown rather than one where there is a very fixed and definite known injury. But to look at the injury, and this is a picture which I think some of you will have seen before of a facial burn in airway. And very quickly, when given fluids, we just heard Bill Hughes talk about the leakiness of uh, the tissues. Very, very quickly, uh, an airway, uh, the, the face swells and an airway is lost. This patient now cannot be intubated um, if they've not got a, 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 a stable airway before the swelling takes place. And what are the risks of airway problems? Well, these increase with uh, burns uh, around the nose and the mouth. So there's evidence that they've been inhaling smoke, which then further, if the soot goes into the nostrils of the singed nasal hair, burns of the tongue and the back of the mouth, whether there's intraoral swelling, whether there's horse in the voice, and then if there's someone who is capable of doing a laryngoscopy, edema may be noted, and of course, the patient may become stridulous. We consider that two or more of these equals the smoke inhalation injury. Uh, the fire, history of the fire, carbonaceous sputum, perioral burn, altered levels of consciousness, symptoms or signs of respiratory distress, hoarseness, loss of the voice and stridor, and uh, a raise in the carboxyhemoglobin over 15% and impaired gas exchange. The diagnosis is clinical, really. Um, blood gases have a role. Chest x-rays are not good to document uh, or exclude inhalation injury, but are an important part of the process of documentation. And bronchoscopy. And uh, the, the Bronchoscopy can be both diagnostic and therapeutic. It may actually tell us to uh, what um, number of bronchial uh, tree the uh, injury extends uh, and give us an idea of the likely uh, amount of toxic substances that have been absorbed into the person's system. Uh, and we can then, of course, uh, talk uh, at a future time point um, about how we manage inhalation injury. Of course, sometimes a chest injury uh, requires an escherotomy, and you can see here a chest escherotomy using a checker technique as well as lower limb escherotomy. 
Uh, what tests do we do? Well, we can keep it pretty simple, a full blood count, UNE, coagulation profile, liver function tests, CRP, glucose, particularly in children. We absolutely have to have a blood gas to check, see if uh, what the carboxyhemoglobin is. Well, certainly in someone who's got any history of suspected inhalation injury. And important to check toxicology where available. And that can be done on blood screening uh, and uh, also on urine. Um, Alcohol screening may be done on um, the uh, uh, either of uh, blood or urine, and we can also look at hemochromogens. Uh, ECG may be appropriate where somebody has a history of an electrical injury, as well as a, uh, a fast scan, which is a point of ac uh, access uh, ultrasound uh, scan. Um, Large uh, burns. Or, oh, sorry, yes, Oren, can sorry. we look to wrap up in the next couple of minutes? We're sort yeah, of absolutely. Yeah, over, we're so pretty much there. Two, yep, two minutes, perfect. Thanks. Two minutes, no problem at all. I'm just going to take you to the very last one. Undoubtedly, um, I'll go to the very last slide, in fact. I think it's important to, to uh, look and listen uh, to the patient. Um, and then lastly, just to talk about learning and going back to the States, you can just read this yourselves. Uh, almost 100 years ago, uh, Fulton Roy, a surgeon in the US Navy, reported 32 patients with extensive burns. This is the time before fluid resuscitation was standard. He gave morphine to control pains and all patients with major burns as a continuous salt solution. However, this was given rectally. After the patients were considered resuscitated, they were given water and large quantities of nutritional liquids every two hours by mouth, including two or three eggnogs to which whiskey was added during the night. And note that's the Irish and American spelling, not the Scottish spelling. In the fourth and fifth week, to combat what was termed exhaustion, a tonic of phosphorus, strychnine and quinine was administered. So I don't mean to be facetious, but uh, this is a shared process of learning. We hope to continue the journey together. And it would be fair to say, having read the last slide, that a wise man and woman learns from the mistakes of others. Cheers, Oren. Thanks. We're going to move on. If I pass it back to the chairs, thanks. Thanks for that, Oren. Thanks very much, Welcome. Oren. I'll come off, stop screening. So I'd like to just bring in one or two questions. and. There's a very good good question come in about the role of um, noradrenaline and adrenaline and other vasoconstrictor or cardiotropic drugs. And I'd like to bring in Peter Javalski first to discuss that in the context of burn resuscitation, because that, that can be a, a key issue in, in resuscitating a burn patient. Um, Peter? Just repeat your question, sorry. Role of noradrenaline, adrenaline, and other oh, I, yeah, I think, uh, I think there's um, uh, no evidence one way or the other. I think as long as the um, patients have had enough fluid, um, and it depends on what the hemodynamics are. If they need a presser, they need a presser. Well, so, I, but they need to be adequately filled. I think the uh, all, all the bad press I think it got in the part, in past would, were, when people had presses without um, being adequately full of uh, volume resuscitated. So I, I've never seen any evidence um, uh, about graft tape and the use of presses. No evidence at all. Could, it's a surgical myth. Can you just explain that a bit further? Because the, the, a lot of the audience will be relatively unfamiliar. And this is quite a key issue this change of thinking in, in our working lifetime. Uh, just go, explain a bit further what well, you I think we might best well. ask this question to one of our anaesthetic colleagues, but um, uh, the, obviously noradrenaline. Adrenaline is um, not commonly used, uh, in my understanding, uh, as an inotrope. Adrenaline, depending on the dose, acts as an inotrope and also a vasoconstrictor. Uh, noradrenaline has mainly uh, a vasoconstrictive um, property. Uh, again, I think it's dose dependent. But uh, traditionally, to maintain blood pressure, people will give noradrenaline. And you can do that, but if the, the patient's not uh, properly resuscitated and hasn't had enough volume, uh, you then uh, don't resuscitate or you don't perfuse the peripheries. Uh, and typically, people used to get black fingers and black toes and uh, it, uh, whilst being uh, on high doses of presser without having uh, adequate volume. I think understanding of fluid resuscitation, mainly by our anaesthetic colleagues, uh, certainly in the UK, 
has changed that uh, paradigm. And, and now, usually, people are, are, are well fluid resuscitated before the, the need for inotropy. So that, that's related to better monitoring, uh, the use of obviously um, uh, techniques uh, and devices to monitor cardiac output. Uh, stem vascular resistance and all those other parameters of, of, uh, of the circulation. So Thanks a lot, Peter. So whilst our next speaker, uh, Mike Bazler, is getting ready, if Mike can get ready to start, I'd just like to ask a similar question to Rajesh and Muga Krishnan and Ram Varam from Ganga about their perspective in a, a, a middle-income country or now becoming a high income country in parts India, isn't it? Um, but about a middle income country about using vasopressor agents in, in resuscitation and, and what your perspective is on that. Because certainly in, in our practice, as Peter says, if we have patients who have been well filled with fluids who still aren't responding, as Bill said, um, you would then maybe use albumin earlier. If that didn't work, you then might move on to a presser. Is your perspective similar in your practice? Um, what, give us your views on that, please. I think uh, our, uh, our practices are very similar to what uh, uh, Professor uh, Peter Dubuski said. I think that uh, as Professor uh, PD said that first of all, we need to fill them up first properly and then give them a process. And invariably, a lot of uh, people uh, do need some pressures eventually because a lot of them become septic. And once they get septic, they need some pressures as well. So it's, it's a finally a balance between all of them. And as uh, Professor PD said that first we need to fill them up properly. Once filled up properly, then we need to add them up with, uh, with uh, all these pressures. And we also do use albumin though. But the only problem with albumin is that it is quite costly. And, uh, and uh, a lot of people in our country can't afford it. The problem is that a lot of people can't afford treatment beyond two to three weeks, so which is becoming a problem in our country. Can I ask you and Ram, do you have a colloid that is a substitute for albumin or is there nothing really that, that, that functions as that in, in your setting? Uh, no, uh, there is absolutely no substitute for albumin at the moment. So the way I have been doing it is to actually start albumin from the word go. So when the patients present to us, calculate the Parkinson's formula and take 50% of it. And then the other 50%, I start giving 20% albumin. And I've been collecting data on a lot of factors. Increasingly in the intensive care circles, the pendulum has swung from giving too much fluid to giving as minimum fluid as possible. And we use dynamic monitoring in the form of point of care echoes. We look at venous dopplers in the hepatic veins to see hepatic vein reversal of flow and base our fluid strategy on that. And I've also seen extremely good results with patients reduced bleeding, early uh, uh, return to mobilization for a lot of patients with the current fluid strategy that we use at this point in time. We are collecting data and hopefully in the next 12 months or so we should be able to get a good paper going with that. Can I just check? Thanks a lot, Ram. Is Mike, are you sharing your screen? Could you please share your screen if you're giving your talk? Stuart, also let me know if you need any of the uh, other polling questions at which time. I, would, I was just going to wait with them until we just try and get through everything. Absolutely, that's fine, yep. And now I'd like to welcome Dr. Mike Basler, consultant anaesthetist from Glasgow Royal Infirmary. He anaesthetizes regularly for burns and he's also highly regarded, as well as being a very, very good burns anaesthetist, he's also a highly regarded expert on pain management. So welcome, Mike. Mike, please may I check that you're unmuted? There we go. Sorry. Okay. Hi. Hello, Stuart. Thank you very much. I'm going to really just cut to the key issues here, which I think are very important for our patients in the developing world because or, uh, there is a variety of different resources that are available. So 
the first, one of the key things that I think is often available in the developing world is a, a mobile phone. So when I ask a, a patient or when I see a patient acutely in the resuscitation, the first thing that might be very useful is to get a picture of their face because their face presumably isn't like that. And if I know that their face is swollen or that is their normal face or whatever, then I know that inside the airway is swollen. So what that then allows me to do is to prepare. I'll just try and get to the next slide. Oh, it doesn't seem to want to go. Hold on. There we go. So airway issues are common in Burns patients. They're also common in, in all patients. And preparation is the key. And if you can see here on my slide, this is a surgical airway in its most basic form. A scalpel, a thing called a gum elastic bougie, and a small ET tube. Now that is the final part of your plan. But when I was working in, in a, the developing world, but also back home, I will have my team ready to go with the airway issues. I will be prepared and we will have talked through a plan A, which may be a smaller uncut endotracheal tube with a, a rapid sequence induction. We will talk through our plan B, which might be bag and mask if we're in real trouble, but it may also be to get the airway via surgical airway or some of these adjunct techniques. So we've, we're prepared. And, and we do this. Now, when we look at breathing, for many places in the developing world, the access to ventilation is very, very difficult. So what I would say to you is the most important thing to think about is to build things slowly. A pulse oximeter is a very cheap and useful device that you should have. Think about your monitoring charts, examine your patients and get x-rays before we start talking about the ventilatory strategies. As Oren said, it's incredibly important to have an understanding of the nature of the mechanism of the burn because that will give you an idea about whether, say, for example, it's an enclosed space and carbon monoxide and smoke inhalation is involved. It tells you lots and lots of things. Now, if we move on to circulation, obviously the parkland formula in crystalloid is key and has, has been discussed a little bit before. And in my opinion, and, and the way we look at it, 20, for the first 24 hours, you're really looking at using fluids. And remember, this is a dynamic situation. So if you, for example, know that, that there has maybe been an explosion that's led to a burn, then again, you're going to be constantly reassessing the patient to say, have I missed an injury if I'm having to use lots of blood and lots of fluid? Now, you will lose lots of fluid. But in the first 24 hours, I'm going to use the Parkland formula. I may use albumin more e quickly in a child in that, in that formula. And, uh, and as has been mentioned, w w there is a move away from just using crystalloids. But there's also a move in some centers, as has been suggested by our friends in Ganga, about using inotropes. Now, the key issue here, and I, and I can only speak as an anaesthetist, not an intensivist, the key issue here is that we are moving back towards a more restrictive fluid strategy for the ensuing days after the initial resuscitation. And that's twofold. Many people will be aware of the thing called fluid creep, which manifests itself in abdominal compartment syndrome. But there's also reasonable work to show now that actually for the management of sepsis and a ARDS and a variety of things, excessive fluids are, are not particularly useful. So we will probably end up using inotropes day two, day three, particularly as I said, if sepsis is available. Now in the third, I used to work with some very excellent pediatric anaesthetists who could work out how many drops in an hour would be given. And in the third world, you can give inotropes through pediatric given sets. But again, you need to monitor the patient and you need to be very, very careful with this. I can't stress hard enough how careful you have to be if you haven't got any infusion pumps, but it is a mechanism by giving, to give these drugs. So we're going to look at the Parkland formula. We're going to be think about modified albumin, and we're also maybe going to think about blood. Most of our initial, as an anaesthetist, our initial kind of treatment may be decompressive surgery in the first instance, but then we're going to look at early excision and the patients can bleed a lot. What we're going to do is we're going to work with our surgeons to make sure that if blood is difficult, that we can prevent blood. So again, the early use of uh, adrenaline soaks or adrenaline in the, in the tissues, also things like tourniquets, but essentially trying to keep control of this thing because often in some developing countries, blood and things like FFP and other clotting factors are very difficult to get a hold of. I know that uh, 
one of the, the questions was about the use of vitamin C, and there's also been work on hypertonic solutions. But essentially, current practice would say that the role of the parkland formula is still the predominant mechanism by which patients are resuscitated. And I would add that after that, what you're looking at is treating your patients in surgery with possibly some blood, if you have access to it, certainly trying to prevent it, and maybe considering the use of inotropes in the first instance when you're dealing with some of these patients. Okay, sure. Thank you very much, Mike. Thanks a lot. So, you, I think Mike, there've been quite a few questions that have come in from the audience about using fresh frozen plasma or albumin. And essentially, as Mike said, they have similar effects, and it's really a matter of using which you have available. One very important question which has come up, which I'd like to ask to Bill and Michelle, is what particular advice would you give for first responders to avoid making injuries worse? Which is quite a nice question. And uh, maybe not the easiest question to answer, but what sort of things about avoiding making injuries or making the situation worse for first responders, please? Well, I think the important thing is making sure the first responders themselves are protected, scene safety, uh, that they're not going to get hurt, of course. But I think for the patient themselves, making sure the what we do for trauma, protecting the neck, uh, protecting the, the back and long bones, especially with electrical injury. Um, and, uh, you know, if there's a chemical involved, start the irrigation early, I think is also very important. Um, keeping the patient warm, you, you know, we wet them down or they, or they, they may soak them down to if, if they were still on fire and then keep them warm with, with, with blankets and keep them protected. Yeah, we, we've moved away from doing wet dressings. They used to transport people in wet dressings. So we don't, we just tell them clean, dry blankets or sheets, take all their clothes off, keep your rig warm clean dry blankets. We also ask them if they see that there's extremities burned to try to elevate them even in transport, keeping that limb elevated earlier for our physiotherapists and other nurses here. Um, it's priority for us. So we, we do ask that they do that as well. And also no ice. We're still getting patients, believe it or not, that come with their uh, ice baths, hands in ice buckets and things like that. And then we've also had frostbites develop on some of our, uh, our burns too. So um, priority is basically telling them no ice, keep them warm, elevate extremities, and do not give too much fluid just to run the, uh, the rate that we suggest at 500 cc's an hour for adults. And we do say for access, it's okay to go through the burnt tissue. Um, IO access is very common here also, so we do get a lot of patients who, who are getting, you know, infused through the, uh, the long bones. That was just great, that last point, Bill, because you've answered one of the questions that one of the guys asked. So also, um, first, Nicole Lee, and then Michelle again. Can you, Michelle had just mentioned this just now, and it's another very important question. Can you just tell us about dressings in the immediate scenario, Nicole? And Michelle, then, if you can also carry on with that. Um, so dressings are um, going to be important to think about um, in regards to what you're actually going to do with the patient. Um, if it's going to arrive and you're just going to assess them straight away and take them to a theatre environment, then putting something expensive um, or something that might actually create an escar is the worst thing you could possibly do. Um, so actually sometimes doing it simple is the best thing. Um, and clean film, um, we do um, regularly say, is the best thing to just cover over the wound bed um, on transfer and then we'll look at them when they get there. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's all dependent on what the next process is for your patient and knowing what's gonna happen next. And presumably, as, as Michelle said, using a transparent cling film like that will also stop fluid loss cooling of the patient that you would get if you put soaking wet things on the patient. Absolutely. Michelle, Michelle any further comments about your um, dressing in the first receiving situation or in the transfer situation? You don't, you'd mentioned that you try and keep those relatively dry. Any other thoughts about that for, for people around the world to, to think about? I, a clean, dry blankets or sheets. We don't ask them to dress anything knowing that they're coming to us and we're going to be removing them, which cause pain and anxiety for patients anyway. So the, the just dry, clean and warm is, is really what, how we want them transported to us. And then we'll uh, clean the wound and assess it once they get here and, de and determine what the best uh, dressing will be that we put on. 
Thanks a lot. I'd like, not, like, like to now welcome Nicole as our next speaker. And she, she was a tremendous speaker in two different sessions that we had recently. So please share your screen with us, Nicole, so you can give your lecture. Hopefully you can see that. We can, thank you. Perfect, okay. Um, so um, thank you very much. Um, not not a, a large thing to, to follow, obviously. Um, but um, I'm um, just gonna talk to you a little bit about the early management of burn care from a nurse's perspective. Um, because um, as we've talked about, there's lots of things that are gonna be going on with these patients. Um, but actually, what does that mean for us? Okay, so um, this is um, one of our common scenes. This is our admissions room um, where we work. Um, I will say um, for the people that are actually looking at this, this is not a real patient. And actually, um, I would say what Jorge said earlier, um, that actually we're a team approach, especially in our admissions team. Um, and potentially um, it takes all of us. Um, and what we will tend to do um, in our service is practice our approach to that. Um, just like the Formula One teams, the more that we practice, the quicker and the better we can get at that. Um, so this is actually one of my simulations for our anaesthetic teams and doctors um, that we run regularly. Um, so practicing that process is really useful. So I can't obviously talk about first burn um, care without mentioning first aid, which has been mentioned numerous times already. Um, but I think from a nurse's perspective, we need to think about Sometimes our patients have um, some home remedies that they like to put on their burn wounds. And actually in lower mi middle income countries, sometimes they will go to other places like the local witch doctors and stuff to have things put on their wounds. Um, and sometimes from a hospital setting point of view, it might be really important to try and get some of that stuff off, which can dry and be quite hard and, and difficult to come off. Um, so from a nurse's perspective, we need to have an understanding of what it is that they've put on that wound before they've come in um, and so that we can then actually work out um, how we're going to get it off sometimes um, and that might mean that we need to give our patients some strong painkillers and a good clean and I've mentioned early on um, in my other talks that we know that that actual burn wound is sterilized as it's heated up but actually what's around that burn wound might be that if they're on fire they might jump into the pond next to them um, to put themselves out and actually that is really important to know when we're thinking about decolonization and bacteria that might grow later um, and I've just put a reference on the side there in regards to training of first aid um, it's um, really proven um, no matter where and when that if you put some effort into doing some local training or um, further afield training actually you can promote that good first aid of that 20 minutes of cool running water um, if they've got it available to them. So when we think about that early management um, we can uh, look back at our books and potentially the ABC of Burns talks about that rescue of the initial stage, resuscitate, retrieve, resurface and rehabilitate and they're all really to be started right early on um, within that first 24 hours of care. And actually by getting our patients adequately rescued, resuscitated with fluids, retrieving them into the right areas, thinking about resurfacing, um, and it may be that you're going to do that very early, which we do uh, facilitate in our area. Um, but actually, um, if you're not, then how you're going to look at that process for that patient over time and actually starting rehabilitation early um, really shows good outcomes. Um, and so by getting that early on and getting you thinking about that is really important. I like to try and keep it simple and I teach a lot of our nursing staff to think about the fact of what the skin does and if we think about that then we can think about our priorities. When we think about the skin um, I like to think of it as in the skin is quite sensory when the moment you take that top layer of skin off and if you've got your superficial wounds coming through the door they're going to be in agony and sometimes just by putting something over the top of the wound bed will reduce their pain massively. I've been down to A&E numerous times and been the person that's just taken the time to put some clean film over the wound bed. And by stopping that airflow to get to their uh, nerve endings, it's actually dropped the pain relief and the pain control needs massively. So by doing that well, it can really help. The skin obviously keeps fluid in, so we need to replace the fluid that's coming out. 
and actually in the big burns um, you'll be seeing it on the bed it will be rolling out you'll be getting the, um, the all the sheets wet and that can lead on to them getting cold so we need to be thinking about replacing that fluid and keeping them warm infection i kind of mentioned it already but whatever's around the outside of that wound will get into the wound bed so we need to be thinking about that early on and getting them swabbed real early on um, and i've mentioned temperature is a huge thing in our initial management um, and i've talked about it in numerous times we're, we're, we're constantly always heating patients up or cooling them down um, but in them early stages trying to keep them dry and wet and um, warm is really important Keeping it in a more structured way from when we're actually doing our assessments at that early stage and looking at the airway in particular, that airway is going to be really precious to you. And actually what we need to be doing from a nursing perspective is securing it well. Now that can be really hard because our patients are going to be swelling. And actually um, by having some, we use um, tape type devices to be able to hold them because you just can't get anything to stick sometimes if you've got a facial injury. Um, so by securing them well, but actually keeping a very close eye on them, because as they swell, that tape's going to dig in. And what you will then end up with is actually stopping blood flow to their head sometimes. So you need to be conscious of that. Trying to reduce the swelling in that airway as much as possible. Fitting them up can be really useful. And the ones that haven't got the, the real bad airway burns or the initial um, or the suspected inhalation injuries can actually be nursed, set up right and might actually stop them needing a tube. So again, be working with your team, working with your anaesthetic colleagues um, and make sure they don't cut the tube. You're gonna need that extra length to be able to tie it and secure it well. Um, so be really, really forceful at that beginning stage. Don't let them cut that tube. Moving on to breathing, um, if we're suspecting smoke inhalation, um, then we're going to be looking at our carboxyhemoglobin levels and our blood gases. Um, and we've kind of mentioned the word cyanokit in the background. If we've got a reduced GCS and early lactate, they are clinical signs that there might be um, a problem going on and there might be that suspected cyano poisoning. So by giving a cyanokit, what does that mean to us? Well. A, someone needs to make it up um, and it's never the time to learn that on that initial stuff. So knowing how to make them up, um, there is some support in the packs that come with them. Um, but remembering that actually then you're going to have a really red urine that's going to come that follows. Um, it can be quite scary for um, people to not realise that Sinokit's been given. So making sure you've documented it because you might actually um, take that for uh, myoglobin urea later on if you don't realise that your patient's had it. It is a real luminous red that's going to start coming out in that urine. Administering that high flow oxygen early on um, and working alongside our blood gases um, and discussing with your local services. It may be that these patients might need escherotomies to the chest just for you to be able to deliver a good tidal volume to these patients. Um, so do, um, do be thinking about that in the background. In circulation, you are going to need to be giving these patients fluid, especially with the larger burns. So you need to be getting some IV access in. If you can get to good sized large bore cannulas, that's great. If not, we might need to be going for the CVP lines and art lines um, and we'll be getting them in early. But securing them in the burns world can be quite difficult. Um, my middle slide there, any burns nurse that you'll find will be become uh, immediately um, attracted to anything that sticks really well um, and um, we like to uh, bandage things in as well um, quite quickly because it's really difficult to keep them in place and the last thing you want to do is lose them and um, we want to be taking bloods um, and sending off for cross matches and things like that getting our patients ready for um, theatres um, and blood gases working and um, titrating according to them um, is going to be really important. Um, it's got their elevation of limbs um, and what I will mention that's been already talked about is the fact of having your um, uh, cardiac output studies and we are really proactive with that. We get our cardiac output monitors on real early on and then guide our fluid therapy according. Um, we will start things like vasopressors, uh, noradrenaline is our normal one that we go to first and actually um, we will uh, make sure that we're giving our Parkland formula and our fluids to the appropriate levels um, and then if our cardiac output monitoring gives us the ability then we'll be giving the noradrenaline. I will always say though, you wanna be on the least amount of noradrenaline that you possibly can. Um, so we're always trying to get it off. 
Um, so um, any time that we get to our, our targeted levels and we normally set them with our anaesthetic team that we might be hitting trying to hit max of 70 to 75 then potentially as soon as we get there then you'll start finding that we're trying to try to down straight away um, and that will happen over time over that first 24 hour period sometimes um, but it might not um, and so we might need to add in some inotropes as well uh, but hopefully the vasopressors and the fluids will be enough We'll always be guided by our urine output um, as well. So if we really want a good urine output, um, if we've got gallons coming out, then we might be able to titrate that down. Um, but if we haven't, then we might need to be giving more. And actually that will be the times that we're recalibrating our cardiac output monitors to see where we're at and whether or not we've got room to give more fluids um, before we'd up any inotropes or vasopressors. I want to mention early on that in disability, you need to be looking in them eyes and you need to do that early because if these heads are gonna swell and these faces are gonna swell, you will not be able to get back into them eyes later on. So it's really important that you get your fluorazines and be checking them pupils um, because it might be um, a good 48 hours before we get back into them eyes sometimes. Um, so knowing early on that you've got a patient that's um, worth working on. We have had patients that have had blown pupils that have not been noted straight away and then not been able to get into the eyes can then be difficult later on. So you really need to get that documented and checked early on. Um, on the exposure section, um, we think about what might be on the, on the patient. You need to get rid of anything that's tight, any jewellery. Uh, we know that in the, these big patients, they're going to swell. So we want to get rid of whatever's rings tend to be the ones. Um, and sometimes you might need to cut them off, unfortunately. Um, I've got hydrogel burn dressings in there. Um, there may well be um, some dressings that different companies and different places like to use. Um, you need to get them off so you can um, assess the wound bed well. If they haven't had first aid, it can be done for up to three hours post-injury. So it's worth remembering that when they get to hospital, if they have made it early, you can still do that. Um, we want to um, clean the area um, and potentially within our service, we would take them to our admissions room. And sometimes they might need a full general anaesthetic to have a good clean up. Um, and so potentially we would probably be um, doing a triple prep on them and trying to reduce our bacterial load, getting them swabbed real early on, thinking about them infections that might come later. Um, we want to assess, uh, assess the extent of burn, working out our percentage areas. So we can make sure our calculations are right. And actually what we realize is that in our referring places, then it's quite difficult when you're not doing it all the time. And so we need to be making sure that percentage area is, is correct. And we do have an amazing system in the UK where they can send us images before the patient is sent. So we can have a bit of an idea of what's coming in. Um, we need to think about what's on them, what we're gonna put on them wounds. Again, like I've mentioned, if we're gonna be going early to theatre, there's no point putting on really expensive dressings that are just gonna get chucked away. Um, so it might be that we just cover over them uh, nerve endings with something um, and get them to theatre, or it may be that we, we, we tend to like a good gel and embetidine pad in our area, um, which we make up in, in big dressings, um, and then we just cover them over until they're ready to go to theatre. It might be that they come in in the night and then go to theatre the next day. Something that's quite in, inexpensive, but does the job well, but also has that antimicrobial layer um, that can be killing anything off as well. Um, I've mentioned warming the patient up um, and I can't stress that enough. Uh, that's one of our warming devices um, and um, having your environments nice and warm. Um, and we have um, the overhead heaters as well, which we're quite lucky to have. Fluids, we've mentioned Parkland formula. Um, I'm not going to go through that with you anymore, um, but we tend to use a Hartman solution because it has less sodium if we're giving large amounts. Um, so that's why we might, uh, you might need to think about what it is that you're actually giving. Um, and uh, others have mentioned um, albumin solutions, um, but um, we would be using Hartman's as our initial stuff um, and then going over to our albumin's after 24 hours. Um, we've got pumps. Um, we've talked about, or there's been mention of drip rates. Um, if you haven't got pumps, then yet you do need to work out your drip rates. And sometimes these patients might need huge amounts of fluids through um, small vessels, um, so you might need things like pressure bags um, to be able to deliver that and get that in. It is really important to give that fluid 
um, they do need it. It will be leaking out into everywhere that it shouldn't be, um, including your bed. So you do need to replace it. Um, so um, do think about how you're going to get them large volumes through. Um, and it may be then pressure bags can be quite useful for that if you haven't got pumps. Um, we need to think about um, getting some nutrition in. Early nutrition's are good. And I'm really pleased the word abdominal pressure has already been mentioned. We do need to be considering our intra-abdominal pressures with these patients, um, but early feeding also. Um, so um, it's really important to try and think about how we're going to deliver that. Um, and we go for NJ tubes quite early on to be able to do that. Um, we need to be thinking about tetanus statuses um, and thinking about getting our what antibiotics we're going to be using once we need to use them, not giving them early. Um, you may need to keep some patients nil by mouth and that's the, the cut off for when you've got intubated or not if they're going straight to theatre. Um, so sometimes we might give our patients um, some um, high, high protein drinks or, or get them to have a, um, something to eat before their nil by mouth moments. We might wake patients up to do that in the night pre-theatre. We need to be thinking about safeguarding concerns and early on um, if the patient isn't intubated or even our referring people, um, getting histories from patients and understanding what's happened is really important to us as a team of people for who they're coming to, because it might be months before we get the chance to actually speak to them about what happened. So getting that history is really, really important and getting it written down um, and becomes really handy for the people that are later on trying to decipher what's happened. Um, these patients can sometimes tell us the wrong story. So equally having our surveillance out there is really important too, um, because um, it has been known that they can tell us that they're not trying to nick the copper off the railway, um, but they are. Nicole, I'm really sorry. It's a great presentation, but we just need to tie it up fairly soon because I'm, I'm desperate to get the panelists back in. Thank you. No problem. I've got just two slides and I'm okay. finished. Thank you. Um, I've mentioned wound care um, and um, I would always say that potentially um, our um, clean films it the easiest and best for transfer initially. Um, and I've just put this on here um, as a, um, a link to something that might be useful for your teams. Um, we have written some competencies um, which might be useful. Um, the specialist burn care for non-specialist units has got all of the initial management stuff for your nursing teams that you might want to consider getting them trained in. And that's me finished. Thanks a lot, Nicole, for that superb no presentation. Problem. Thanks very much. I'd like now to go to Sarah Smales, consultant physiotherapist again. And Sarah, can I just ask you specifically about management of the the physiotherapist's role in the management of the intubated patient uh, with an inhalation and also general um, role of the physiotherapist in, in treatment of the, the major burn in the early stages. Thanks, Sarah. Sarah, still with us? I think she may have had to leave, uh, Stuart. Okay, I think she sent that. a message. Apologise. Okay, next question then for Raja and Ram. A very important issue is about the delayed presentation of patients um, in low-income countries. And can you give us some insights into how you manage resuscitation and wound care in a patient with a resus-sized burn who presents already in shock? Because this is a really major issue in low-income countries. Thank you. I think we have a very, very uh, big problem regarding the delayed presentation of burns. And uh, this, this is because uh, in all of uh, most of our hospitals, we have a lot of multi-drug resistant organisms in, with us. So when they, when they come in a delayed presentation, what really happens is that they already become very, very septic. And then uh, they have the BP, the BP is low and uh, so on. And so what we do is that the first thing that we did try to do is that we try to give them a lot of uh, um, uh, fluids because they usually are the less on fluids. We put them on inotropes and then we give them, we, we need to start them uh, especially on sometimes on high antibodies such as miroparam or sometimes even on colistin because our, uh, our uh, antibiogram is such that. And then we give the best shot and after two days we probably try to get the burns out, deep burn out. 
So do you find you much more often have to give empirical antibiotics to delayed presentation patients than you would patients who came straight to you? Yes, sir. Okay. In fact, we, we need to do it. And uh, in fact, we have to start them on high antibiotics because generally within uh, the whole of uh, in the place that where I am, we have a lot of uh, gram-negative organisms, which are the, which are the most predominant, multi-drug resistant gram-negative organisms. Thanks very much. Can I just ask Bill and, and Michelle with their huge experience, um, obviously you may not see so many delayed presentation patients, Bill and Michelle, but any further insights you'd like to give because it is a huge issue in the, the lower income countries? Uh, you are correct. Very rarely do we see very delayed um, presentations. Uh, sometimes they may end up stay at a, another hospital for a day or so but most of the times they, they are being treated correctly. Um, it is very difficult, it seems, sometimes to play catch up with when they, they do here. get to us a little bit later if they are under resuscitated and we will start giving you know, more fluids and hopefully get them to where they need to be. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on, just to bring in now Krishna, who has a couple of case presentations. Krishna Kumar. I'm sorry, Krishna, we're, we're short of oh, time. Yes, to ask you to do it quite quickly. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, sir. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Um, here I am going to present the two different case scenarios which will be open for discussion. My first case is a 45 year old school teacher who was while lighting a lamp in a temple, her sari accidentally caught fire on 19th at 10 40 a.m. in an open area. She rolled on the sand floor following the fire, and the people around also poured water on her. Uh, then she was taken to a nearby hospital where they started the ringer lactate at a rate of 350 ml per hour and the patient was catheterized there and uh, during the resuscitation they have applied silver sulfadiazine ointment was applied over the wounds and the wound was kept open and referred to our hospital. The patient was received in our hospital one day later on 20th August at about 10 pm. And this is the presenting picture. The patient is having uh, flame burns with the deep burns involving the anterior trunk and both upper limbs, abdomen and the both and the, involving the thigh areas only anteriorly and posterior and back was everything was free. And the patient has a typical past history. The patient was diagnosed as an acute inferior wall myocardial infarction six months back and the angiography was done and thrombolyzed with streptokinase. And the patient was on the following medications. That is tablet clopidogrel on 75 mg, bisoprolol on 25 mg, and atrostatin on 45 mg. And during the presentation in the morning, the patient had a dose of clopidogrel. And the patient is having no other medical problems. And the social history was the patient was with, uh, with her mother and the son, and she lost her husband and daughter living in the another city. And on arrival, the patient was conscious oriented and the airway was normal with no signs of inhalation and injury. And respiratory rate was 21 per minute with bilateral air and air entry present, and with a pulse rate of 108 per minute with a blood pressure of 150-70, and the urine output was 130 ml per hour. And there was a deep burns involving anterior trunk, both upper limbs, both lower limbs, which was calculated to be a total body surface area involving 54%. And this is what this was another picture of the, uh, the patient. Yeah, uh, this this ends up with the, with my first case of flame burns, and the management will be open for discussion. So can I ask Peter and Bill about the North American perspective in terms of timing of surgical intervention for this pa patient? Um, sure. From, from my point of view, I usually will do the first 24 hours for resuscitation and start my um, excision and coverage on post-burn day, basically um, the following day. And usually every day or every other day is needed. Uh, with the wound this size, I, I may use some of uh, something like Integra, so I don't have to make as many donor sites in the in the first one or two surgeries. Um, I find doing it um, staged, I could keep the patient warmer uh, during, yeah, because I could do that about two hours, about 20, 25% of the body surface area. I could keep the patient warmer and hopefully with uh, less um, blood loss. 
Thanks very much, Bill. Actually, I don't think Peter's still with us. So, Raja, what's your protocol for timing of surgery for, for this lady? So for this lady, we are almost excise all of the burns, actually, and then we uh, we put an allograft on the patient. Allograft, okay. Yeah, so, so we did this. We resuscitated the patient for one day, and then we did uh, we we then uh, did the surgery the next day. So she was already she already came to us one day post burn. So we actually did the surgery for her on the third day. Thanks very much, Michelle. Can I ask you if for some reason you couldn't? This lady wasn't fit enough for surgery. What would your choice of antiseptic dressings be to prevent infection for this patient? Uh, looking at the eschar on her, that we would probably choose to use sulfamylon just because it penetrates the eschar well, okay. much better than the sylvanine would be. Um, and so, and typically in big patients like this with a lot of eschar that we're not getting off uh, immediately, we would use sulfamylon. And Nicole, what would your choice be um, if you had to dress with antiseptics instead of um, surgery if for, if for some reason the patient wasn't suitable for surgery? Um, it depends. Um, we may look at things like flamazines. It depends what um, if we're just going for a conservative treatment option. Um, we may move on to things um, dependent on our bacterial load. Um, so we may use things like hypochlorites, um, vinegars, honeys. Um, to um, to dress the wounds um, according to their bacterial load. Thanks very much. That's very helpful. And, uh, just for the international audience, sulfamylon is a, a very, very good topical antiseptic, which we don't have access to in Britain, but is widely used in North America and, and is excellent for its penetration. And the other ones that um, Nicole's gone through there are, are we, we are often, we, we use relatively simple antiseptics in the UK, as, as Nicole has described, that are widely accessible and, and they're all things which will be accessible in low income countries. Um, we're now getting to the end of time. So I, I don't know, can I just ask Nadeem's advice? Shall we ask Krishna to do his last presentation or do we want to I think, just- No, I think, I think so. If it was similar length, I think it was yeah, nice. Krishna, yeah, please, yeah. please press on and do your next page. Thank you. Thanks Nadeem, that's great. I'd like to see it anyway. <clears throat> I'm present presenting my second case. The baby is a 60 months old child weighing 10 kg with a history of split hot milk while playing in a kitchen. He accidentally pulled the milk jar and sustained scalds on 21st April at 6 p.m. And the parents immediately poured water over the child. And this was the presenting picture, baby having a superficial burns of the involving the face, anterior aspect of chest and left upper limb and the back. The patient was in, baby was initially taken to a nearby hospital at 9 p.m. where they have started on IV fluids, ringer lactate, but they haven't mentioned the amount infused. And for pain relief, they have started a syrup paracetamol 75 mg was given and the patient was received at our hospital about five and a half hours later at 11.30 p.m. And to moving to moving on to history, the baby was immunized up to the date, and there was no developmental delay. And the social history: the baby is a single child, nursed by both parents and the grandparents in their home, with no comorbidities. And the baby on arrival was alert, febrile, and crying, and no airway problems, with a respiratory rate of about 21 per minute, with a bilateral air entry present and no adult sounds, and a pulse rate of 120 per minute. And the vision was normal, and the baby was able to appreciate the parents. And there was this superficial burns involving the face, chest, left upper limb, left left side of the back, with total body surface area of 25%. And this will be open for discussion. So can I just ask Bill about his perspective on the management of the skull burn as opposed to the, the plan for excision of the, of the flame burn and the, the previous lady? Um, fortunately, it, it, from the pictures, it does appear to be second degree. So I think after washing and, and cleansing the wound, um, especially with the, the pediatric population, I like to use a dressing that could last for a few days. So I would probably use one of my silver dressings so that way they don't anticipate the, the pain with the dressing change and makes it more comfortable for the patient if that's available. On the faces though, I will usually use um, something, uh, antibiotic ointment a couple times a day or even Supertel uh, because again, you don't have to change it and it, it decreases some of that um, anticipation of pain that the child has. 
Bill, can you just explain for those around the world who don't have access to Supratel what, what that is, please? Um, it's a it's a polymer dressing that uh, it it's I use it on faces, I use it on donor sites. It, it is a little bit more on the expensive side than some of the other dressings, but it's a polymer and you it looks like uh, white copy paper when you put it on and it sticks. You wrap it with a non-sticky layer for two days, such, such as adaptic, and then you can take the adaptic off. And I usually leave it open at that point. And it actually helps with the healing and especially with the face, it decreases some of that crustiness you see from the uh, leakage of the fluid. Thanks very much. Mike, I know you're not a pediatric anesthetist, but um, can, you, can you just give some advice about procedural analgesia for this child to have dressing changes? What your advice would be to combinations of analgesics for procedural pain for dressings? Hi there, can you hear me, Stuart? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think you're going to have to, again, I, I get back to, I, I bang the same drum, which is to make sure that you watch the child if you're going to do anything procedural, because you need to make sure that whatever you do is safe, or maybe do in theatre. Obviously, you may want to use, a, a, I'm not a pediatric anaesthetist, you may want to use morphine if you can, if there's access, and a dose of 0 0.05, I think it's to 0 0.1, but I would check that up, because as I say, I'm not a pediatric anaesthetist. You can also use ketamine. Our hospital uses intranasal things, such as intranasal midazolam, and also intranasal diamorphine and intranasal fentanyl have been used in the past as well. But again, I, I want to make it clear that I'm not a pediatric anaesthetist, but I'm sure as part of our talk series, there are plenty of pediatric anaesthetists who'd be happy to talk about this a bit further. Other. But that's what I'd be looking at. And Nicole, any further particular points you'd like to mention about management of this child's face from a nursing point of view? Um, so um, by looking at this, I mean, I'm itching already just looking at it. I want to give it a good clean. Um, but um, potentially um, the intranasal diamorphines work quite well. They work really quickly, like Pete was mentioned, um, like Mike was mentioning. Um, so um, because it works quick and doesn't last for long. Um, but actually, I'd probably be suggesting for us that I'd want this patient to have some biobrain put on in theatre um, because um, then potentially um, it can then um, it's got that layer on and the aftercare for that child would be a lot less and it could probably go home a lot quicker. Um, so that would be what I'd be pushing our surgeons to do. Thanks very much, Nicole. And just for those around the world who are listening, biobrain, similar, different, totally different material, but it, it's a porcine collagen biological dressing, which fulfills a similar um, requirement to what Bill described for the Supratel for the face in, in that it, it adheres to the wounds and protects it and reduces pain. So just to thank Krishna very much for those two very nice presentations and, and go back to Raja and Ram finally about your management of this, this child. Um, what, what's, your, what's your management been in, in your scenario? So what we did was that we used uh, Acticote for this child and then, um, and then um, in, in 10 days time all the wounds had healed and then this child was fine. We just uh, replaced Acticote every five days and then used it. And Ram, anything further to add to what Mike said about the options for procedural pain for dressing change? It seemed to me that that was pretty comprehensive and, 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 and we're not going to hold Mike to it as a pediatric anaesthetist because no, I, I, think, I think very similar plan. There's no difference to what we use here. We don't have access to intranasal dimorphine, unfortunately. So we do use a combination of ketamine and fentanyl and sometimes just put them off to sleep completely and then take over. So I'd just like to take the chance, this chance personally to thank all the speakers and the panelists for a really great session this afternoon, especially our panelists from um, United States and from India who joined us. It's, it's a real privilege to have met you and to hear from, have heard from you this afternoon. And I'd just like to hand back at this stage to Oren for his summing up for, for the end of this session. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Stuart. That was really a wonderful chairing of the session and uh, really insightful and probing questions. And I think uh, the discussion has been really invaluable. I, I'd like to thank everybody for participating. I'd like to thank you, Stuart, and co-chair uh, Jorge for a fantastic session. I'd like to thank all of the panelists. It's been a real pleasure that you could respond. Everybody was so positive. I hope that this will be the start of a conversation going forward that we will have, you know, as many people and more perhaps involved in the future. 
Uh, we hope to have uh, another session in a month's time on the 16th of October, where we're going to look at the first week uh, uh, of a patient with a major burn in ICU. So that's, the more you think about these uh, talks, uh, there's so much to just the acute phase of burn injury that needs to be done. Um, I will put up, uh, we will send everybody who participated the, the, the program for the coming year. Um, I'd also really like to thank uh, those people who, who've worked in the background to make this possible. Uh, Nadim Kowaja, who's in the front and also in the background, has been a wonderful support through this, as well as um, Jorge uh, on the uh, burn interest, uh, as the burn interest chair at, at BAPRAS with uh, B First, the uh, British Foundation for International Surgical Training, and um, the British Burn Association, and of course, uh, Research Africa. And I would like to thank at each of those, um, uh, Gemma Adlington, Emma Brighton at uh, BAPRAS and B First, uh, Nihama Lewis at the British Burn Association, and Elizabeth Dell at Research Africa. So we hope that going forward, we'll be able to uh, develop a series of conversations that we'll be able to put some resources in place, potentially on a fixed website that people can access, maybe access uh, these um, talks as well again. So thank you all very much. And um, it's been wonderful seeing you all here today and I hope you all enjoyed it. So we'll see you on the 16th of October. Bye.